much. Okay, it's five o'clock, so uh, I'll call this meeting to order. Board of Commissioners special meeting that we're holding tonight. Uh, uh, it's really sort of a listening session and uh, kind of table discussion to hear from the providers and, uh, and see if we can work through some stuff. We've allotted one hour for the meeting. Uh, this is a special meeting, and so we want to be focused on this particular issue. Uh, our regular board meeting will be held next Thursday. At that meeting, we'll have time for public comment and everything. Um, this is an open meeting uh, in accordance with the Public Meetings Act and all that, but, uh, but really it's just uh, for us to have a conversation with the providers. Um, we're going to start uh, the meeting uh, by uh, having Julie sort of talk about the current state and we'll hear from uh, uh, from some uh, guests that we have here that we'd like to, to sort of talk uh, talk through some things. Um, Mandy has uh, everybody's uh, name down who's here, so I don't think we need to do a, a roll call or anything. Mandy, if that's still correct. All right. Um, so Julie's going to start us off, and then we'll uh, start the conversation. Uh, Julie. All right. Um. We've also invited, so we invited the uh, women's health providers. So we're still expecting Holly Dotson and Emily Trotta, hopefully, so that we can hear from the whole contingent. I wanted to, we've talked about KDH being in the full spectrum women's health business. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what that meant to KDH in terms of staffing in the clinic as well as in the hospital. Um, in KDH Women's Health Clinic, we have a combination of OBs and F. Uh, family practice or family medicine physicians who are surgically trained in obstetrics. We also have a certified nurse midwife, a physician's assistant who's trained in obstetrics, RNs, MAs, and the registration staff. So that is a public park facing ambulatory staff that we have. And uh, have I missed anybody? No, okay. In our family birthplace, we staff, oh, oh Holly's here. Um, in our family birthplace, we staff two specially trained labor and delivery nurses 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, we also staff one patient care technician, which is a CNA, one of those 24 7. And we have a labor and delivery nurse who is also our family birthplace director. For anesthesia services, and again, this is, you'll see in, in the next slide. In order to provide the service 24 seven, we have to have an anesthesia provider available for epidurals and C-sections. We also, the stuff in blue is all about the mod. The stuff in purple is about what the labor and delivery nurses call a bonus patient. That's about the baby. So in order to deliver these babies and provide full spectrum women's health, we need to have a pediatrician or family practice physician immediately available 24 seven. We also need someone in case we're doing a C-section to assist with that C-section. That can be an obs a physician, obstetrician, certified nurse midwife, or a general surgeon. And then if the baby isn't acute, this is normal delivery, we need a pediatrician or a provider who rounds on the baby before the baby leaves the hospital. So this is the business of providing full spectrum women's health at KBH. So this is the people we need to have immediately available for an unscheduled C-section. So this is the full boat of providers that we need to recruit for and be able to rely on. We need a delivery provider that can be an OB or one of our family practice with surgical OB immediately available. If it's family practice without OB, we still need to have one of the OB gyms or one of the surgically trained folks available in case they need to do a C-section. So three o'clock in the afternoon, when they get the call, they've been following the labor all day long, and the doc gets the call that we think it's go time and we're having trouble here, they have to leave the clinic. And that is very disruptive during clinic hours. The rest of the day gets canceled. You have some angry patients whose appointments are being scheduled. After hours, if they go in at two o'clock in the morning or they're, late, they're with the patient all day long, the issue then is they are facing a full schedule of patients the next day in the clinic, and that can be exhausting, disruptive. Family birthplace, we have the labor and delivery nurses, again, two of them 24-7 in-house at all times, um, but active labor is a one-on-one. -on -one. So you have a patient on active labor, 
you have exactly one spare nurse. Anesthesia services, these need to be immediately available. Up until recently, we had two to three max anesthesia providers. We now, in our transition to Evergreen Health, have 13 anesthesia providers credentialed to help fill that bench. But currently, or, or until recently, well, um, during regular surgery hours, if we had an emergency C-section or an unscheduled C-section, that pulled that anesthesia provider out of a surgic surgery, a scheduled surgery, and it could disrupt the surgical schedule for the rest of the day. Similarly, with acute newborn, we're calling a pediatrician or family medicine has to be immediately available. They have to be NRP and stable certified. During clinic hours, we just grab that doc, we grab that pediatrician, and they just we just blew up their schedule. After hours, if that doc's waiting for a transfer or they're calling for a place for that baby to go, it can be hours during the middle of the night that with the baby, they're facing a full clinic the next day. C-section first again, uh, first assist, we have a few more options here. Certified nurse midwife, we have our general surgeons who do this. Family practice or family medicine providers are OBGYNs. Same disruptive effect if we have to do this in the middle of the day, exhausting effect if we do it after hours. So this is the full boat staffing for uh, surgical uh, C-sections, unscheduled C-sections. Uh, so a little bit about the roles. So uh, OBGYN sees patients in the clinic for routine women's health. And oh, nobody throw anything at me if I left anything out or got it wrong. Mm -hmm. I did fact check with Stacy Botton. So. Um, OBGYN see patients in the clinic for routine women's health and OB care. They also provide GYN care and take those patients, schedule those patients for gynecological care and surgery. Uh, they report to the hospital for vaginal surgical, scheduled and unscheduled. They just have to be there. And if they're not primary here, they can provide that first assist. Family practice with surgical, see patients in the clinic for routine health. What's missing here is the gynecological care. So they do everything in the clinic. Um, they report for this, the uh, surgical and vaginal deliveries. They can be that first assist. This is a mom doctor. A family medicine doctor can also, I don't think we're currently doing it, but they could also provide acute newborn care. I think Dr. Wagen has done that for us in the past, and they can do well-born. So moms, family medicine is kind of the utility player here. Now, I will say where KVH until a week ago was headed was looking for two OB, minimum of two OBGYNs and Dr. Wagen at the OB. So we, we were uh, recruiting for two to three OBs, and we had uh, Dr. Dawson, and we have Robin at uh, family practice with surgical OB position. So we were looking for four providers to fill that primary deliverance provider role. Next role, certified nurse midwives. They see patients in the clinic for routine health uh, and GYN care in the clinic. What they can't do is the surgical delivery. So again, you got a certified nurse midwife on for OB call. Just like a family medicine doc without surgical, um, you have to have one of your OBs or surgically trained people on the bench. And they can do first assist. They fill out that call schedule. Our PACs in the clinic see patients for uh, in the clinic for routine women's health and OB care, see patients for OB care. Again, they're kind of a utility player. Um, they can do I, uh, they can do C-section first assist, they can do well newborn. Um, but they have that family practice background as well in many cases. General surgery can help with C-section first assist. And then surgically trained FBOBs um, use general surgery for backup in the case of an emergency hysterectomy or if something goes terribly wrong, they need that general surgery surgeon to come in and assist them with that. So these are the players. A walk down memory lane here. Um, at a point in 2019, KVH had an FPOB who was surgically trained. That was Bruce Herman. Uh, we had CHCW had FPOBs who were non-surgical. Uh, we employed one OBGYN. I believe that was Ginger Longo in 2019. That was me. Okay. okay. I only had one in 2019. I, I joined. Well, I joined in 2019. 
Okay, so we had two OBGYNs at some point in 2019. Um, we had a community OBGYN who was John Sand, and we had FPOB non-surgical in healthcare, family healthcare of Ellensburg was still here. The providers at that time largely delivered their own patients, and this could mean being on call every day. They coordinated some call for coverage between independent providers. Patients expected to be delivered by their own clinic provider. That's kind of an expectation. And patients understood and tolerated to some extent that there would be some chaos if their doc was called away to do a delivery in the middle of the day. Active members of the medical staff by the bylaws are required to participate in call, not to exceed 10 days. So that's medical staff bylaws. That hasn't changed. I've never found anything but that that 10 day call. And so that's one in three that they're on call. For KVH employed physician, compensation for that first 10 days of call was considered to be in the base pay. And KVH did not pay community providers to provide call because that came to them through the bylaws through that 10 day obligation. As recently as 2022, KVH had one FPOB surgically trained. That was Dr. Casey. He has since moved to a full-time practice in family medicine. We employed three OBGYNs. This is the first time I had Polly show up in 2022. We also had Maribel Serrano and Ginger Longo. So we had three OBGYNs. CHCW is a great partner in this community, but they're, they have incredible staffing issues as well. They plug in where they can, but we can't rely on them for the kind of coverage that they were providing back in 2019. Um, Dr. San had since retired and Family Health Care of Ellensburg had set up direct primary care and were no longer delivering. Providers were sharing call by 2022. KBH was paying for all the gaps in the call. Patients uh, were delivered by the on-call physician by and large and patients were far less tolerant of us blowing up their scheduled appointments when a provider had to be taken out of the clinic. Active medical staff members were still required to participate in call not to exceed 10 days, but we were getting the message last year loud and clear that the market was no longer about 10 days a month. It was about something less than 10 days a month. Physicians were largely in agreement that 10 days was not sustainable. The discussion for our OB providers was between five and eight days a month with being sustainable. KVH began paying for call in excess of eight days a month and pay KVH, we didn't pass, we paid for gaps in the call schedule. So this is sort of the, a point in 2022. Um, Maribel Serrano left at the end of 2022 and Jitter Longo left at the end of August, uh, April 2023. Again, as I mentioned before, we were recruiting for two OBGYNs to have two OBGYNs and at least two and two FPOBs, so four, four providers. We were also working with an organization called OB Hospitals, and we had made a commitment as an organization. We sat down with the providers, and our, our vision of how community health care is provided has always been that we recruit people to the community, they buy a house, they become Ellensburg Bulldogs, um, they live in this community, they're members of the community. So that was what we were after. And we all said, yes, we could go to this OB hospitals group, but before we do that, we want to double down on recruiting our own folks in. We last week, this week, made the decision that we're not going to be able to do that. Uh, we had stayed in contact with OB hospitals group, and we have a memorandum of understanding and are working out the details on a contract for 24 seven OB coverage. The difference between OB hospitalists and the regular laborist groups, and laborists are folks who would provide a doc who does nothing but deliver babies. Um, OB hospitalists provides an OB gen, and they will deliver babies. They're here 24 seven to fill that call schedule for us, but they also work in the clinic for us. So they will go over and we have FPOB surgically trained, what our, our hope is, with an OB there all the time, with two delivering physicians, we'll be able to fill out our GYN. So we'll be able to provide even more GYN services. And we've already talked to surgery about allowing for a full day of GYN surgery once we get started. 
So in, so this is what we're looking at with our certified nurse midwife, our F surgically trained FPOB, and 24-7 OB coverage from OB hospitalist group. That is what we're seeing as the provider contingent for delivering babies at KBH. In our clinic, we'll have our surgically trained FPOB. We'll have that GYN, hopefully again, focusing on GYN patients. We have Anna, who's our, our APC providing care there full-time, and a certified nurse through midwife. So this is the place that we're asking the question, what more can we do for our patients? How can we build out women's health in the clinic in the ambulatory setting? And again, our OB hospitalist group, uh, we hope to have scheduled for a uh, day a week in surgery to provide scheduled GYN services. So between 2019, in 2023, that's been the transition of our, our OB services at KBH. I did want to touch briefly on acute newborn because, again, that is a place similar to our deliveries. One more. Thank you. Uh, we rely on physicians, and we're, we are not as settled in acute newborn, I think, as we are once we get OB hospitals on board. Prior to October of 2018, we had Ellensburg Pediatrics. Uh, that was Elise Herman. She was part-time by that time. She had about 1.6, 1.5 APCs working in the clinic, and they did well newborn, but they did not do acute newborn. So they didn't, do, they didn't fill that role of a physician. And that is true of pediatric nurse practitioners. They're either clinic providers or they work in the hospital. That seems to be the model. We had community family practice. That would be... Uh, Family Health Care of Ellensburg, CHCW physicians, and importantly, we had CHCW residents. And that was a deal I think that Dr. Herman had struck with the residents. She did a lot of proctoring and working with them, and in exchange, they did a lot of acute newborn. And then we had some participation from KVH family practice physicians. Fourth quarter of 2018, KVH. Um, acquired Ellensburg Pediatrics. Elise was getting ready to retire. She wanted a year or two after Bruce Herman retired. Um, so we acquired her practice and we added a full-time pediatrician. So in 2018, we went from a 0.6 pediatrician to a 1.6 pediatrician to serve the community. But in 2019, that acute newborn staffing really reached critical levels between CHCW, Family Health Care of Ellensburg, we were getting thin on the ground in terms of providing um, uh, providers and acute newborn here. It was really at critical levels. And we sat down as a leadership group and made a commitment to hire four full-time pediatricians. So we said, we, this, we have to have docs to do this. We are tired of cobbling this together. We don't want competent folks to come in and take care of our kids. And with four, that gives us seven to eight days of call a month for each one of those providers. It also gives us the ability to enhance support to the emergency department around um, pediatric questions and patients who come in there. And it provides, we, our, our dream was that in a few years time, once we solidified this group, we could provide support for lower acuity inpatient or observation pediatric patients. Our hospitals program goes to 18, 16. So some, we wanted to be able to retain some of those patients that we were shipping out who were being seen in emergency departments and, and sent home. Fourth quarter of 2020, KVH added another full-time pediatrician. So we we're at 2.6, um, but Elise Herman retired sometime in 2021 or, the, or early 2022. So we were down back down to 1.6. In January of 2023, we added another full-time pediatrician, so we made it up to 3.0 KVH pediatricians. We were very actively recruiting for the fourth on our way to that four full-time pediatrician model. Uh, very similar market conditions for pediatrics that we were seeing in OB. In March, again, we'd just gotten to our third in January of 2023 when we heard from the pediatricians that eight days a month was not going to be sustainable. The pediatricians felt that three to four days a month for them on acute newborn or call to the hospital was what was going to be sustainable. You know, that that implies if we're going to do this all with pediatricians, that we were going to need nine or 10 of those, and we didn't need nine or 10 clinic uh, 
uh, pediatricians in Kittitas County because we have family medicine docs who want to see kids. So, but we knew the only place we had that kind of bench was in family medicine, and we turned to family medicine Ellensburg. We already had a couple of docs from family medicine Ellensburg, Dr. Wright and Dr. Stone, who had were taking acute newborn call for us. The other uh, three physicians from Family Medicine Ellensburg have since agreed to do that. They took became NRP and stable certified. And Dr. Martin arranged for some uh, simulator training to come in to refresh their skills and make them feel more comfortable and make Stacy feel more comfortable with him. So we have five family medicine docs from Ellensburg and Dr. Thomas from Flea Allen who all agreed to be part of this acute newborn call. So we stopped recruiting for a fourth pediatrician. We feel like we met that need. Obviously, we're not going to be able to do these things as robustly as we wanted to, but we have acute newborn taken care of. We adjusted our model for pediatrics. We ceased recruiting for the fourth pediatrician, and we are focusing. We will have KVH pediatrics. We know there's a component of our community that wants to go to a pediatric clinic. We also know we have family providers who can set family medicine, who consider that a very important part of what fills their practice. They want that as well. Um, but we will have a pediatric clinic. Um, we have two pediatricians now, and we hope to fill that ambulatory role with advanced nurse practitioners and folks who can see people in the clinic. Acute newborn in the future will be uh, covered by a combination of family medicine physicians and pediatricians. So. Uh, the warning is this is not that settled at this point. We have some work to do. We have call schedules for July, August, September fulfilled. And I just have to say, I, I so appreciate family medicine stepping into this. It was, um, they saw the need, they're committed to providing labor and delivery services in Kittitas County. We want to see babies delivered here. So they stepped up. So that's where we're at. Thanks, Julie, uh, for giving us kind of a way of the land there. Um, the, that sort of tells us where, we, where we've been and kind of gives us a sense of where we're going. The purpose of this meeting is to talk about where, where we're going now. Uh, before we get to that, talk about what kind of the ideal state is uh, for sort of providers, including nurses and uh, patients. I know that Dr. Dawson had a few things uh, she'd like to say, so. Uh, uh, your floor is yours. All right. So, um, first of all, I want to say that thank you for allowing me to work in these walls since 2019. Um, it's been a pleasure to work here. It's been a pleasure to work with the administration. It's been a pleasure to work with the nurses and the staff and everybody that's been here. And this was a very, very difficult decision for me to make. Um, and the decision for me was based a lot on my personal life needs, family needs, burnout needs, things like that. So um, I recognize that the board and administration has really identified this as a concern and has been trying to find solutions. But I also realize that in the world of healthcare right now, some of those solutions are not the easiest to find. Um, so changing models now, I think is probably a really good choice for the, for the services and community. Um, but it just didn't happen fast enough for me. Um, part of that is my consideration because I wasn't ready to jump on board with having a service come in and kind of fulfill those needs because I thought we could still do it. Um, and then, so it's it's been a it's been an ongoing discussion since people started kind of stepping out. Um, so. With the administrative burdens and with the call burdens. Being a community OBGYN in a rural setting is just more difficult than it used to be. And I don't know if it's necessarily because of we have more red tape, we have more paperwork, we have EMRs, we have all the stuff. <clears throat> or is it patients are more acute and there's um, more needs. Women are heavier, they have more high blood pressure, they have more, more things going on that we're constantly working on. And then part of it is expectations. So if we look back in the past, we used to have doctors like Dr. Sand and all of those other pillars of the community that you think of 
that their lives were their practice. They saw all their own patients, they delivered all their own patients, they were on call for themselves 24 seven. As a mom, that's just not sustainable for me. Um, I have a child that's uh, in high school. I have a stepdaughter that is about to start high school as well. I want to be there for the moments with them. I want to be able to be the mom and not just the dad that rolls in for dinner and then rolls back out because he's got another patient in labor. Um, and so the, the expectations of work are changing. The other thing that makes rural medicine difficult right now is the expectations of training are changing. So OBGYNs are trained in large hospital facilities with lots of backup and lots of support. So they're trained where there's an MFM next door that they can ask a question to. They're trained where if they're in a surgical emergency, they have interventional radiology, they have urology, they have all of these subspecialties that are, can come in and help them. I was trained in a rural um, residency where I was trained in a hospital, kind of like this a community hospital that didn't have all the backup. So I was trained to be aware and be ready for those things and to know that someday it's, uh, it's probably gonna happen. You're gonna need to be able to do things that maybe outside of your comfort zone to make sure that people are taken care of well. And that's just not the expectation anymore. So residents that come out of training are not ready, not prepared to work in this environment. And so it's harder to recruit people to work in this environment and work the way traditionally community OBGYNs have worked. So there's a lot of things going on right now that are bigger than the hospital, bigger than, um, than what's going on here, that America needs to wake up and we need to figure out what's going on and we need to figure out how to make a solution. OBHG is trying to figure out a solution for it, but I don't know if big companies taking in, taking over and coming in as the the solution for every town. Um, so one of the reasons that I'm leaving also is so that I can have some more time to go to Olympia, knock on doors, talk to senators, talk to the Rural Health Collaborative, talk to the Department of Health, and really see if, if we can make some changes and, and let people know. I went to a leadership conference with WSMA, which is the Washington State Medical Association, and one of their leaders is an OBGYN that works on the west side. I told him that I'm the only OBGYN in a county. He had no clue, no clue that it, that was happening anywhere, that this was even a problem. And I'm like, you're, you're in the same profession I'm in. We need to know that this is a problem and we need to make change. Um, so this move gives me more time to be able to do that. Um, one of the other things that was a struggle here at KVH for me personally was I want to fix it all. I'm a fixer. I want to make it work. And there's so much to do. And there's so much administrative things to do that it takes time to do that. It takes teamwork. It takes cooperation. And when you're working as many hours as I work and trying to see as many patients in the clinic, there's no time to really do that justice. And so having more administration time may have been helpful, but again, the job is still really good. So I don't know if that helps clarify or, or anything, but I love this hospital, I love this town. I'm not moving, I'm not leaving the town. My son rides his bike to school. I'm not taking that away from him. He's going to be in running start, all great things. Um, and so it's been really hard to make this decision. Um, and so I want you all to know that I love the hospital and I love to run it. And it's been really a pleasure to be able to work here, to be able to work on leadership and to grow. And I don't want to see it fall apart. So I'm really excited that y'all are taking steps. I mean, not the steps that I would have seen, but steps to solidify this in the community and make it stay. Thank you. Um, appreciate that. Um, very well said. And I think uh, sort of gives us a sense of what's happening. I mean, it, this probably is not any consolation to you, but this is a sort of common story that we're hearing um, across a lot of the uh, Rural uh, systems. And so I'm going to go knock on some doors. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, uh, yeah, we appreciate that. Well, especially when you hear of like Lower Valley shutting the programs down, right? Concern like 
bring people in as well. Exactly. But if we don't make a change and make it sustainable, and if we don't train providers to work in this environment and make this environment one that that can be worked in, then five, ten years from now we're going to be in the same spot. That's yeah, that's well said, and I think that's uh, that gives us a good sort of transition to how we can make it sustainable under the conditions that we're that we're in now. Um, and so I don't know, Julia or Dr. Martin, if you guys want to get the how you'd like to get this conversation started about our ideal state is and then how we get there. So, um, and maybe I'm being Pollyanna about this, but I, I do feel um, that within three or four months, we, we may be able to feel more stable about how we're, we're covering physician providers delivering babies in the hospital. And that's, that's, you know, we're all over uh, locums right now and you know cobbling things together so that feels like it will be more stable i guess you know if fourth quarter 2023 is where we start this program um i'm really anxious to hear what nurses and providers and the folks that are facing these patients every day want fourth quarter 2025 to look like what what's the patient expectation what are we doing? How are we getting patients in? How are we supporting our pa our patients? How are we making it sustainable for providers and for the nurses? So this is a starting point. We're going to bring in these OBGYNs seven coverage. You guys are the the you know staple of the work. How are we going to build with this? How are what are we going to do? Actually, a little discussion about this in clinic. Um, about accepting new OBs, they asked uh, how many patients per month can you, you know, allow in clinic to, and I was not prepared to give an objective answer. My gut feeling is we should probably untether things and just see whoever calls. Um, I'm not sure what will happen if we do that. We're going to work a lot. Uh, see lots of new OB patients, which is great. Um, but we will have to probably make adjustments in work duties. If primarily, you know, we're seeing one new OB each every day, that would be wonderful. Um, but then we also have to take call and, and, and try to figure out, well, if we have a group that's going to provide somebody in clinic to see patients, but also take call figure out how much call we'll take versus how much work and time we're going to spend in clinic seeing patients to keep the pipeline going. I hate to use the word pipeline, but yeah, that's what it is. But and it's, am I correct? You're really interested in delivering babies. You don't, you don't want to become a clinic provider. You, no. So part of what we're working through with the contract <clears throat> is making sure that we're coordinating with OB hospitals group so that Dr. Wagonek gets to continue to have that full uh, women's health. And it's, it's worth pointing out for you guys that the same principles that we used when we were working out our agreement with emergency associates of Yakima, um, nobody's gonna lose their job for this. Um, the people that have served KVH, we want to continue to serve. We want, your, we want you where you are. And, uh, I, I think of you guys as the bricks, and we're using OB Hospitals Group to fill in around you and make it sustainable and make this work that we can do. And uh, the words that I keep hearing are reliable and sustainable, and make sure that, that the service we provide is both of those. One of the um, things I talked to Jess Rasmussen. Uh, this morning, when she asked me, well, how many new patients, you know, per month it will take, is I asked her to look at old data, clinic data, your department, how many deliveries we do per month, and try to calculate how many visits new OB and then prenatal visits. And then that was based on the number. That was a great uh, historical walk through OB. Uh, but based on that many providers versus how many we have now, what is realistically the numbers we'll see? How many visits do we need to cover to do that? And I think that's my biggest worry is 
and that three sturdy folks, but uh, and an OB guide that every five days it'll be somebody different. Um, we're we're all used to working. Though. We just need to make sure that we have realistic expectations, and that we can then meet those expectations. So, it, so is that? I'm really excited about um, certified nurse midwives. I'm, I, we also, I just have to say this at every meeting, have this fourth <laughs> trimester program um, where we see our our moms when they have passed down and deliver and make sure that they're safe and healthy and getting the resources that they need in their babies. So, um, I, I, so again, I feel and. I, I hope I'm not proven wrong. I feel like if we can set aside this constant hum and tension about covering the delivering providers, we can turn to the clinic, we can turn to the community and say, okay, what else do we need in our clinic to serve, to create, and I, I, you say pipeline, I don't like group, but that's what we're talking about. Just see those patients, get the patients in so that we can see them same day if they're having issues, but that, clinic piece is a lot easier to focus on if you're not plugging holes in the OB and the delivery schedule three days out. Your apropos phrase earlier was almighty access. Almighty access, yes. So not the almighty dollar, it's the almighty access. So, but yeah, I mean, that to me is an exciting product and exciting team to work with. You talked about access and that's, you know, that's been a priority for the board for well, for this board for many years, uh, but uh, to, to tie it back in with stuff that Dr. Dox was saying is we don't have, a. I mean, we used to have uh, independent providers like Dr. Sands, so we're in many ways the only game in town, but what we're finding is there's a huge demand for services that we have to offer, which in the one sense is, one hand is good, on the other hand, it's hard to keep up with all that. Plus, we're facing all these workforce issues, and there are many facets to that, including the fact that it's hard to recruit in rural, including a shortage of providers, including all these things. So, how do we? Uh, that's kind of the big picture. I don't know how we how we manage that. Uh, we've been talking about specifics, but how do we how do we manage those uh, those different forces, which are all sort of pushing toward? I mean, not that we're going to or want to do that, but basically pushing toward doing what they're doing in the, in, you know, Lower Yakima Valley and, and basically close down. Um, so thoughts on how to manage those larger uh, forces that are all driving, uh, making it harder and harder to accomplish. This. I think one of the, the things that we have going for us is passionate advocates like Dr. Dawson. There's a lot of changes in the medical profession that we allow to be done to us. And um, the, the consequences of some of those are coming home to, to roost. And having people that are willing to go out and tilt at the windmills uh, and tell the stories uh, is going to be a huge part of it. Um, part of it is going to be that we have to be pretty honest um, Dr. Dawson's right. In a lot of ways, last month you heard me talk about the effect that uh, current graduate training uh, hours restrictions has in creating a workforce that fundamentally isn't really well suited to working in rural America. We need to call that out. Um, but what was changes that were implemented in the name of safety are in fact damaging rural healthcare and making it less safe. That's, that's kind of the family doc. I'm trying to, to look at, at the big picture as well as the patient. Um, but we have to be willing to take that advocacy on. Now, there are other thoughts, because uh, I think this is instructive, especially for the, for the board. Um, how we manage these different forces without just the answer being drive our providers into the ground. Because we don't want to do that. Yes. Uh, That's a good statement for uh, our request. So, decreasing chaos and administrative burden within a clinic, um, streamlining patient care. I mean, it's as simple as I'm sure Stacey Alea can tell you, as trying to make all the 
patient rooms the same, you know, so that everything's stocked the same, so everything moves the same. Something that I want to do before I leave is I really want to work with Jesse and with our MA leaders and our nursing leaders, um, Jamie, and um, to work on making some standard works and protocols for the basic things of, of prenatal care that are just something you can't miss on anybody. Because through all of this transition and all of these different doctors coming in and out, it's been difficult. Traditional, the way we've thought about it is the doc says everything and, and the doc has to remember it all and make it all happen. That's great if the doc sees the same patient and the same patient sees the same doc all the time. Nothing gets missed. Well, not nothing, but less. But when a patient sees five different docs, then it's like, did this person do that? Did this person do that? Where are we? So streamlining some of those processes that are standard of care so that the orders always get put in at the right time for prenatal care, that, that um, patients always get their um, ultrasounds scheduled in an appropriate manner. Um, those kind of things I would like to help and work with making that burden less on the providers so that they can spend more of their mental energy worrying about the people that are outliers that need more services, need more care, rather than just the straight making sure everything everybody's at least getting their teed up in their third trimester. Does that make sense? So, so if I could ask for anything in the next three months, not anything, just one thing, um, is if we could find a way to carve out some time for you to do administrative functions, I will, we, sorry, uh, we will then be able to work more efficiently as a team because an OB guy who's worked here for three years, four, 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 four yeah, um, can basically lay the groundwork for standardized workflows. And then it makes it easier. And I think that would be very, it'd be money well spent, time well spent. Because the more you standardize things, the more the <clears throat> clinic staff feels comfortable and more secure. Um, so one of the things that I've heard feedback from some of the MAs and stuff is, well, this locum does it this way and this one does it this way. And I can't remember who wants what and how to do it. And so if they know that everybody's going to be taken care of the same, unless there's a high risk situation going on, it makes their job easier. And so they're more likely to stay and feel more productive in their job. So it's a trickle down effect to help sustain the whole system. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, I was just going to add also making standardized work for providers and uh, yes, locums coming in. It's like well, who's documenting in the pregnancy to do's and who's not even putting anything there. And I think things have been getting missed because of that. And also so standard work for like, we had a bunch of providers leave and locums coming. I was checking six inboxes at a time. Like, what are we going to do with inboxes or um, provider load when we have people coming in and out? Um, it will hopefully become more stable when we have people who are in the clinic consistently. But that has been something. So. I think the way they put this I made mean, it sound right, but like we're <laughs> smarter, not harder, kind of thing, right? Yeah. Uh, so, if, go ahead, Doug. Uh, I'd just like to throw in my two cents worth as a burnout provider. Uh, who now is working as an employee hospital for RPD. I would be careful to continue to focus on the patients. So every single day working here, I hear patients moan that they can't see their own provider, that they don't know who they see. Um, and um, and and that's a bit that's a big problem because things, as Holly was saying, things are missed. I think the model is the model is fine. Um, it's certainly not the way I practiced here when I first got here, where I was the one to, I mean, I was doing 50 deliveries a year when I first got here, um, you know, your patients and all that kind of stuff. I, I realize medicine has changed and a lot of things are different. We have an ER group. They don't know our patients either. We have a hospitalist group. I'm really the only person that knows all these patients because I've been here long enough. And the patients don't know who they're seeing. So this just adds another one of those spots that, that I think we just really need to be careful with, to say, yes, none of us want to be burnt out. I mean, it was terrible for me. Um, I'd say it still is terrible for me, but um, it helps me to work here. Um, 
to heal from from being in the clinic and the stuff that Holly's talking about. But um, I think having the focus on what the patients need is really going to ultimately serve all of this. Let me ask you a quick follow up to that, Dr. Larson, because. Um, is there any worry that the patient mindset is still on this idea of independent providers? Where they are go see one on one all the time, and that's it. patients still want to see their own provider. Mm -hmm. you, you know, I see Dr. Davis as my optometrist. I don't really want to see anybody else. <laughs> I will see other people, and they can adjust my glasses and all that kind of stuff. But uh, every patient I see in the clinic wants to see their own provider and then I get them a follow-up and they say, well, I see Dr. Stone, but you put him in, put me in with Dr. Merrill Steskel. And then, but, um, and those providers don't really know those people. And when we get patients that are in the hospital, it's complicated and, and OB is not an easy profession and those patients are really complicated. And so what Holly is, is recommending is this standardized stuff. I think that's going to help, but I think educating patients that we're going to this whole new model where it's not going to be Dr. Sand eating his apple, delivering your baby anymore, right? <laughs> it's going to be, it might be Holly and it might be somebody else. Yeah. But it's, 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 it's tough on patients and, and I see it here every day. So, so I've, I've worked at KBH for about 28 years. So I've seen a lot of, of what you talked about well before 2019. So, um, you know, there's been an ebb and flow of, of how we provide that care and the model of that. What I can say for the patients reach family birthing and what we want to see for us is we have a, we have a strong RN workforce in family birthing. We have um, more labor trained RNs than we've had in a very long time. We want to help deliver babies. Um, so we want to see the number of deliveries continue to grow. Um, years ago, we were in the mid to high 300s and we've waffled up and down since then. Um, I would love for us to have this access we're talking about and, and give my team the work that we want to do. So, can we, you know, like when you talk about um, like each provider wants something different and we don't know who wants what, right? In standardization, when I first started in OB, every provider had this card of like, could you set up the table for me like this? Yes. And then put it um, angled like this and do this. And I just said, you know what? I can respect we all kind of need some stuff, but if we don't standardize, so you're gonna have the same thing on the table every time. And when you open that up, you might do a little adjusting, but we're gonna throw away these crazy cards of, you know, put this, at 19 degrees Celsius, or you know what I mean, turn it to you know 12 o'clock, and this is how I want it. We have to we do have to have some standardization, and we we work really hard to have that in family birthing. Um, we have a lot of processes and things that are expectations that we follow, and then doing that, we provide that personalized care around it, right? So having things standardized and set up so you have processes doesn't mean you take away that personalization of care. It just means it gives you more time to give that. Okay. So I, I, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I just have to say that, you know, this, this rural crisis in, in labor and delivery and women's health care for us really hit home when Tottenham has closed their, their program and they closed their program like that. And um, so I, I'm on the phone to all my rural administrator friends saying, what are you doing in OP? And, and I found out through that series of phone calls, two were closing, and there were three or four of us that are on the bubble. Uh, we are so fortunate to have the family birthplace RN workforce that we have, and Stacy, because that's that is the hardest thing to rebuild. And they drill, and they are passionate, and don't you get in their way, and it annoys them when they have to float. We have to float, but with volumes down and two nurses, they want to be delivering babies with the, the, what has not carried the late nights through all of this is family birthplace and the current staffing. We are incredibly fortunate. But you need to knock on borders. I know, I didn't. <laughs> May I ask a question? I, I used to work with Stacy years ago, and 
it is wonderful and unique that, that, that there's one-to-one -one nursing to a patient during active labor. That is, that's one of the really special things about KVH. But um, in terms of prenatal care, I'm just wondering, I, Dr. Longo, I know, had suggested centering pregnancy group prenatal care. Is that on the table still? I'm wondering if that might be helpful in managing the prenatal care. I, I had got some training in that. I thought it was really cool. I know there's some evidence for it. Um, so, just a question. So from my perspective, I've thought about it and I've, I've talked about it, um, but I haven't had the administrative time to look into it and to implement it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to follow the model if yeah. you're going to implement that particular model, mm -hmm. and it does take a fair amount of time. So I'm not sure yeah. what yeah. their future designs on that would be. I think it's a wonderful idea. Uh, it's a matter of who would put that together and drive it. But anything that is in the community involving people, integrating them into our care and with each other is exceptional. But how do we do it? Oh, one of the, I mean, this is one of the things we're doing is just sort of putting a lot of stuff in the hopper. I think someone's probably written that down. So we're going to talk more about <laughs> that. It's the wall. <laughs> so we're talking about that. Uh, did you have a, a quick uh, comment? A very quick one, and I know it's not really for public comment tonight. But the entire discussion has been about OB. Not every woman needs an obstetrician, but every woman needs a gynecologist. And I'm, I'm concerned that that part of the picture hasn't been addressed adequately. So, uh, Julie, did you say that uh, under this new MOU that we would actually have increased uh, right. gynecological services? Right. Or and would you one, just of, say one of the things when, again, um, you can schedule GYN to a certain degree, babies are a lot more difficult to deal with, so that was the burning platform, and we had to step away from a lot of GYN care. Um, and one of the things I'm hopeful for, and one of the, uh, again, OB hospitals still say, we'll deliver all your babies and show up in your clinics. We're trying to carve out a specific role for them to expand GYN services for exactly that reason. So that in the clinic, we, we have a provider and a care team that works with the provider who can routinely take care of GYN and then know every Wednesday is going to be our GYN surgical day. That is a luxury we haven't had in a while. Um, so again, we're hoping to to work in that direction, and that's where we're kind of panning out. I will say that um, I've had two um, surgery days per month um, for the past four years, and here recently with the add of the locums, we've really been kind of trying to identify the GYN patients within our patient panel from all of the different providers and trying to get them in and getting them taken care of. We've had, um, what has it been, six or eight hysterectomies in the last month and a half that we've done here in the walls. Um, so we are trying to, to work on some of that backlog before I go. And then um, I know that both um, Dr. Rob Wegenek and Anna Phillips, they are perfectly comfortable and happy and excited to do basic women's health, um, problems with periods, things like that, things that don't need surgery. They, um, if it's clinic GYN, they're there to, to provide that service as well. And then they can identify the people that need to go to the um, OBGYN surgeons um, to, to get them in in a timely fashion and the, the surgery places. That, 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 has, that service has definitely suffered as we, focused on, again, trying to make sure every baby, every baby got delivered, by the way. <laughs> um, I, you know, one of the problems I foresee, and I, I realize that some, uh, I, uh, KVH is a far more functional and listening organization than most healthcare systems out there right now. I, in very short order, we are going to be attracting folks from the outside of our county to this service because they can get in because it's reliable because of the service that we provide in the neighborhood place. Um, I, so I, I think once we get this back on firm footing, our problem footing rather, our problem is going to be that is going to be capacity again. 
we're going to have more patients wanting to become KDH than we're going to be able to serve. And then I'll be able to come back as well, bit fall and yeah. administrator. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. We talked about it. The plan, yeah. the plan with the OB group, if we find that what you're saying does occur in <clears throat> the providers who are in the office providing the care uh, are not able to see all of the patients that are needed, is the plan to have someone from the OB group or having more more providers from the OB group coming and filling the positions in the clinic or would we consider recruiting from additional clinic providers? That would kind of be up to you. I, I mean, again, if I want to get babies over here, um, they are willing to bring a certified nurse midwife. That was actually the proposal they initially made was to bring both an OB gen and a certified nurse midwife for 40 hours a week in the clinic. We have enough disruption right now. We thought, let's get this going over here, but it's in the footnotes that they're gonna work with us to build. Now, at that point, if we're able to recruit a certified nurse midwife or another Anna Phillips, then they, there's nothing exclusive about it. We can do it either way. We haven't, speaking of that, we haven't heard from uh, you. I'm just listening. Is there anything you, I want to make sure that, uh, that you're heard if there's anything you'd like to add to the conversation. Right now, I'm just listening. Okay. All right. If anything comes up, let me. There's something I wanted to say in the conversation wandered away, but I want to turn back to Julie's comment about nursing. Um, the programs that are closing around the state, it usually isn't for lack of an OB provider. It's that they're low enough volume that nursing doesn't keep the skills up. And I think one of the things that we can draw comfort from is precisely the team that you've built. Um, I, I think that really is the backbone that we can hang everything off of. Thank you. It's I me. Mean, my team is very, I feel very passionate about the work we do and as are they, or they wouldn't be committed to, to drilling and doing education and, and showing up for doing the work, despite the fact that, you know, our numbers can ebb and flow and they they do have to float and that that's hard because that's not when you when you specialize in in whatever you specialize in and I can only speak for labor and delivery that's what you want to do right. that's where your passion is and that's where I want my team to be able to do their work but we're having to spread ourselves out a little bit but we're looking forward to that not happening um and so and, so busy that you can't float. yes <laughs> and you know I, I was you know I've been thinking about I kind of back to what Holly had said is when I first started, we were doing in the 300s and we had, and sometimes the high 300s and we had, you know, two nurses sometimes and, and, but the patients, they weren't as acute as they are now. So our patient population is really changing and, and has changed. And one of the things that I don't know about the clinic model, cause I, I can only do my piece and I, I respect your piece cause it is so different than mine. But I do wonder about um, any value in looking at, at the amount of time that you can spend with your patients in the clinic, because these patients, some of those closing that gap on what may or may not, um, you have an opportunity to talk to them about during the, the times that you, you get them. And um, as we're looking at the models and the number of providers you have there, opening up those spaces for longer visit times. I think that our patient population would find a lot of value in that. Well, we're not crashing the whole schedule because your only provider has to run over and yeah. deliver a baby. Yeah, that means that, yeah, it's incredibly. And, and the other piece is, so we've seen lots of providers over, over time and because they retire, they move on, they come, you know, lots of different things happen and, and I'm, I'm always sad when they leave because they become part of our family. I mean, you can't do this work without like enjoying each other and, and develop a relationship because it's a very um, uh, intimate maybe time that you're spending with this family. So you're very close to your provider team. So um, whoever it is that comes, we will also, they'll be part of the family that we have here as well. But we're always so set, like, you know, try to not be emotional, but like, I love Holly and I don't want her to leave. And, and I I've love Ginger. So much from Stacy and, and, and this you department. Know, and and, and Mark when Mark did deliveries. Like everyone that comes in, like they're part of our family. And I I I don't believe that we can support the needs of the patients and the providers with a small town model anymore. 
they need it different. And, and I respect that. And I, and I also respect them just saying, like you said, the market is changed. It's, it's the market is a way of saying the needs of, and the, the voice of providers has changed. They just can't do it the way they used to anymore. And, and I, and I'm glad that we're hearing that because I think that's really valuable. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, it's fine. Uh, I just, uh, I think we can ex extend for a few more minutes. I think uh, first thing, I just want to see if there's anything else, especially Julie or Dr. Martin, if there, are there anybody? If there's anything else that you guys need or any other information, feedback you need uh, before we close it up, and then I, uh, I'll open it up to you guys if, you, if there are any other sort of final thoughts you yeah, have. But uh, is there anything else that you would like to, to have answered or have addressed? Um, well, I, I want to be clear, uh, probably similar to RPG, as we open this program up, there's going to be, it's going to feel like the locums, there's going to be churn. Um, but the plan is to have three to five OBs, familiar faces you see all the time, you know these folks, and, and so it will be a pool of providers who come and do their work and leave, but they will be familiar faces, hopefully be the same folks, so okay. that's my own. Anything uh, else over here before we get? I'd like to just add one, one um, you, know, you know, bringing in a, a group like this OB group, we, we have done it with the hospitalists, we're doing it with our ER doctors right now. Yes, the ER doctors are right down the road. We have um, anesthesia. And I think I really appreciate administration. We, we've tried this before. We're doing it. We're learning from it. And I, I'm confident we will do the same with this group. You know, we have excellent communication with them. We have all the right people at the table. So sorry, Stacey, there'll be another meeting on your books. Um, you know, but I, I, I feel confident that what we've done so far, we can do with this group. Um, and just as from the nursing standpoint, I appreciate that we now have those two nurses in house 24 seven. And I'm sorry about the floating, but it is part of rural healthcare. Every department here does float and we're doing our best. Hopefully we'll get your numbers up but that they don't have to, but we do always enjoy seeing them and we appreciate the help that they provide the other departments. Anything else over here before final? <clears throat> I, I'm looking forward to creating a program that's reliable and sustainable long term. That's what I'm really looking forward to for this community. And I should uh, mention there was a comment from Patricia Sinek on there, if you wouldn't mind that. Uh, uh, Andy, just I think she, she mentioned that uh, we learned a lot with RPG, yeah. and and we can use what we learned there to to sort of uh, help us. With Jump this. Start. She said we learned a lot during the RPG initiation and we can use these learnings to help with this project. Thank you. Uh, so I want to make sure before we close down the, the meeting that uh, you guys have had. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Dr. I have one more, one more comment. One thing that's been another struggle for me in the clinic has been as people have left, I have picked up their patients. And so a lot of my patients feel like new patients, even though they're not new to the clinic, they're new to me. Um, GYN, OB, the whole spectrum. So something I would hope that y'all would help out with is to help protect the providers that are staying to have the time or the energy or keep standardized models so that we can take care of these patients without overburdening them with having establish patient times for basically new patients to them. With the revolving door of providers, I'm a little concerned about how that clinic will flow, that if these providers see them and then now our providers, well, I mean, they're all our providers, but now the, the stable providers are seeing them, um, making sure that there's good communication, good documentation, that that can flow smoothly for both parties. And I think the standard work and documentation is yeah, if, and, and I'm three months into women's health, so, so that shouldn't be coming from me, but someone else creating a safe <laughs> work of how the documentation should look. Because, yeah, as I'm the one who's there four days a week while you guys are delivering babies, I'm seeing the different locums come in and do things all, yeah, very differently in how they're writing these down. It makes information very hard to find. Yeah, to be consistent to a whole pregnancy. Yeah. And GYN care, too, just being consistent yeah. and finding the most documentation things. So I just hope that y'all help support that and however they need Stacey's it. Stacey's making them. <clears throat> okay. Uh, do you have anything to ask? No, no, I'm, um, you know, we, we love having 
whoever it is that comes over to deliver as much as Emily can be here. And I'm, I'm really thankful that this new model is also going to continue to include Rob and, you know, if a, a bringing on another CNM is becomes part of the model with with what um, we need for access, that would be great. I mean, we we're going to adjust and flex with whoever comes in to deliver the babies. Okay. Dr. Uh, look forward to Jesse maybe talking with you about the numbers and trying to make predictions. It's spreadsheet <laughs> about my forte, but that kind of information can be very useful in figuring out staffing and all these questions. So that slots do you need for the patient? Anything to add uh, other than the standardized? <laughs> I think just one other request would be as you guys nail down the big picture with the OB group, um, just giving that information is like what that's going to look like in clinic because we could maybe give feedback of like, hey, well, if Wednesday surgery day, we need these days for them to pre op their patients that they're going to have surgery, just like the logistics of how a clinic um, looks with all the different programs. So, if the, if this works, Trisha Senek is the point on that, and she'll be in your business. Okay. This is going to work. It has to be what we do with you, not what we do yeah. to you. Okay. And uh, Emily, uh, I'll come back to you. <laughs> I mean, I'm the only CNM in this county, and there are none at Memorial that deliver. So you really have a corner on the market, and it's really special that you have had me here for five years. Um, but bringing on more CNMs, I think would be that's a model they have in the UK and in Australia is mostly CNM driven care. And then the OBs do the high risk. So mostly it is CNM driven care. And so looking at that, I think would be really beneficial. I'm so excited. And I, I have to say, Upper Camp, we've got to get some uh, resources for women up in Upper Camp. So we'll be. I miss the, yeah, everybody misses going to play yellow. Okay, um, anything else? Sir, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Uh, we really appreciate this, and, and I hope that uh, everybody in the room realizes that this isn't the end of the conversation. That, uh, uh, I mean, the board members uh, were, were available, but, uh, but also the lines of communication I know with uh, the people on this side of the room uh, is, is wide open. So feel free to, to provide input at any point uh, because we really want to maintain this service, do something that is uh, patient centered, but also ca uh, cares about the well being of our providers. And, and, uh, burn um, I appreciate uh, your, your candor and, and your participation in this meeting. Thank you very much. I know the board really appreciates it. This has really been on our mind. and, and uh, been happy to have this. So thank you. And thank you for the work you do at, uh, at QP and that you've done at QP. Um, okay, so uh, I really appreciate it. This meeting then is adjourned at uh, 607. Thank you.